So, hi, uh, my name's Robin McCorkle. I hope you all had a good lunch and you're not feeling too sleepy. Um, I work for a company called Red Badger. Uh, we like to call ourselves a creative software workshop, or an experience-led creative software workshop. Uh, but it basically means that um, we're a company based in London that builds websites for other companies. Um, so we, uh, we do the design, we do the UX, we do the development, we do the whole stack. Uh, and if you don't believe me, there they are. Although this was last Christmas, there's a few more of us now. Um, so I won't talk about Red Badger for a while, but the two things you need to know for this talk is that, uh, first of all, we love React. Um, we've been using React for a while um, on projects for all of these companies, Fortnum Mason, Financial Times, Sky, Tesco, Lloyds Bank. Uh, I, don't, I know these are quite sort of British institutions, so it might not mean a huge amount, but they're big companies. Uh, and it's been extremely successful. Um, uh, React has sort of revolutionized UI development for all of these uh, companies. And after we introduced it, they've, they've picked it up and they've been really, really happy with it. Um, so we work with pretty big companies. Um, the reason I'm here today is to talk about Tesco. Um, so I'm, I think I'm right in saying right that Tesco uh, does not operate in Italy. Um, so quick show of hands, who has heard of Tesco? Okay, not so bad, right. I was worried that just there would be no hands at all and it would all be nonsense. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, um, Tesco is the world's third largest retailer uh, and they actually handle um, over half, that should say more than half, of the world's online grocery shopping. And just in the UK alone, um, grocery shopping online for the UK at Tesco is the largest grocery shopping site in the world. Um, I don't know why that is, the UK in particular. I assume it's just because we're lazy, um, which I think most people can confirm. Um, but yeah, so just going back a slide, this is the international online grocery shopping site that Tesco asked us to help them develop um, earlier last year. Uh, and it works across seven different countries in all, all of the countries that Tesco operates in outside of the UK. Um, so a couple of other things to know about Tesco is, first of all, Tesco loves uh, UX. Um, they, they're really, really committed to providing great UX to their customers. Um, and uh, and they, yeah, they've got some really, really good design teams working on this. And they, as a company, they're very committed to it. Uh, and React, as I said, for these other companies, has revolutionized UI development um, for Tesco. It's just going from strength to strength. Every development team in Tesco Practically all of them are starting to adopt React now after we introduced it last year. And they really feel that React helps them as developers to deliver the UX that Tesco cares so much about. They find it easier, faster, and, and actually just more fun. Um, so this is a pretty big project for us um, and pretty daunting because there's quite a long list of requirements going into a project like this. Um, or I should say this has been in production since earlier last, uh, earlier this year, so we launched in about January. Um, so first of all, there's your list of countries, um, a pretty diverse set of countries, um, those seven countries, and just those countries alone come with their own list of requirements. Um, you've got brand uh, differences. Tesco isn't actually called Tesco in um, all of these countries. In Turkey, for example, they're called Kipa, K-I-P-A. Uh, their branding is completely different. The logo is different. Uh, all of their kind of color schemes are green instead of blue and red. Um, so the, the site needs to cater for that. Um, there's obviously differences in language. Um, so we offer um, each country English and the native language for that region, apart from Malaysia for some reason, and I think it's a business reason. Um, there's obviously differences in currency that we have to deal with, and some currencies aren't even in the standard character set that we need to support. Different time zones, because we're across a wide geographical difference. And feature switching as well. Um, just from the sort of operation side of Tesco, Tesco operates quite differently in each of these countries. Um, some countries, for example, can't do click and collect just from the infrastructure that they have there. So we need to support that. It needs to be the same website across all of these countries, but with feature flags to turn these things on and off. And kind of related to feature switching is legal requirements. You know, there's quite complex legal requirements for grocery shopping uh, in various countries um, that require feature switching to deal with. So, for example, in Poland, you can only buy alcohol online if you live in Warsaw, and even then, you have to accept a specific set of terms and conditions when you do so. The site's got to cater for that and ignore that for any other country. 
So it's a pretty complex list of requirements already, but um, there's even more. Um, from a business standpoint, one very controversial requirement that we had was that the site must run without JavaScript. Uh, and most people look at that and they go, what? Like, you know, it's 2015, your website has to run without JavaScript? Well, Tesco is really big, um, and uh, they have a very, very small proportion of their users still run their sites without JavaScript. Um, but a small proportion of a very big number is still quite a big number, and that's a large revenue stream. So even a website developed in, well, starting 2014, it needs to run without JavaScript. Uh, and there's actually, you know, there's advantages to that. These are quoted all the time. The obvious ones are SEO. Um, if you can run without JavaScript, most um, uh, search engine crawlers uh, will visit your site and be able to load everything. Google fairly recently announced that they are running JavaScript now, um, so that's not too much of a problem, although we don't know how they're running the JavaScript, so, you know, it's a bit on the fence. Uh, and also, the user doesn't get a flash, you know, so if they're... Uh, if they load up the website, they see everything immediately. They don't see an empty page that then loads as soon as the JavaScript initializes. Um, they get everything in one go, and they can start interacting with the site uh, straight away. And as we said, old devices. It might be old devices, really, really old devices that people are using to visit the site. It might be bots. We've got to cater for them anyway. But we're actually not just talking about devices that just can't run JavaScript at all. Um, we're talking about some other devices that I'll come back to um, at the end. So, big problem. We decided React was the solution to this problem, um, even at the beginning of 2014. Uh, React was quite young, but uh, we'd already started using it on another project we did for a charity called the Halla Foundation, uh, and we loved it. We loved the way it um, allowed us to work as developers. Um, and the server-side rendering that comes packaged into React was made it the obvious choice for a project like this. Um, so it's still quite a big problem for a, uh, a very young uh, framework like React. Um, so React was quite young. A lot of the sort of tools that come with React, like React Router, either were really, really young or weren't around. I think React Router was, but it was very immature, so we decided not to use it. Uh, the flux pattern, for example, if you know uh, a fair bit about React, you'll know about the flux pattern. That didn't exist when we started. Um, so, uh, you know, there weren't accepted patterns for sort of manipulating data in the application. So we decided to just break up the problem. Uh, and we, uh, we actually broke up the problem on a per-page basis. So what we ended up with is a website that is fully isomorphic in that you can uh, visit the site anywhere without JavaScript and it just works but it's actually a series of small single page applications, one for each kind of section of the site. So you go to the home page, for example, you get the uh, HTML back, the client takes over, and you're working on the client side for a bit. You go to another page, say search results, you get a new single page application, carry on on the client side for a bit, go to book a delivery slot, you got a new single page application. And that allowed us to really, really simplify the way that our application was structured. And it allowed us to sort of sidestep a lot of the problems that we might have had um, with React being so young at the time. We probably wouldn't do it um, like this today, but this was early 2014, and a lot changes uh, in that period of time. So I'm going to do a one-handed demo uh, of this site, just so you know what we're talking about here. Actually, I might sit down. That is a very thin mobile phone. There we go. So you can kind of see a bit of the source here. Um, one of the things that we did, uh, well, one of the advantages that having small single page applications gives you is that you can actually uh, load in almost all of the data that you need to view that page on the server side at the beginning. And you don't need to do many AJAX requests. So we dump um, all of that data directly into data attributes at the top of the page, just in the HTML tag which is another thing that people looked at and they thought that that is completely insane. But as, as it turns out, the HTML spec says that data attributes can be as long as you like uh, and the data in them can be as long as you like. And we tested it and we dumped so much data in here and it just, it just worked. Um, we couldn't quite believe it. Even on quite old browsers, it still just worked. So all of the data required to load uh, this particular page is just dumped into the HTML tag. And then on the client side, we have a startup script that picks up all that data, um, passes it as JSON, 
uh, and then uh, puts it back into the React application, and the React application starts up on the client side. So I'll ask you to pray to the demo gods as we, uh, as we walk through this. Usually the demo gods are sort of displeased with me, uh, but this seems to work. So this is the live site. Uh, we can go to a sort of taxonomy. Um, and you can see here that we've loaded in uh, all of the sort of categories of the taxonomy. It's a fairly small taxonomy, so we do it right at the beginning. Uh, and then as we uh, walk through the taxonomy, we're making client-side changes. So we're not doing a round trip to the server. You can see that the, uh, the URL is still changing as we do this. Um, but if we were to turn off JavaScript completely, we get the same page, and we can click around. And the only difference is that we get a full page refresh. Um, it's exactly the same experience, no matter whether you have JavaScript or not. The JavaScript just adds a few sort of UI niceties to this application. So we're going to turn JavaScript back on and go to uh, some search. It's going to Christmas suites, very nice. And now we're back into a, a different single page application than we were on before. So we can kind of scroll through. Um, we can add some uh, a product to our basket. Let's see if I can log in with one hand on my Tempere account. All right. Uh, yeah, so now we can do sort of client-side operations to add products to our basket, uh, and we're all happy. Again, if we turn JavaScript off, um, then we can just do the exact same things, but everything is just a full page refresh when we do it. Um, on this page, we can sort of add search filters if we want to. I think, so that's a, another example of, you might have seen that I turned JavaScript back on, but I still got full page refreshes. And that's because I started interacting with the site before the JavaScript had initialized, uh, which is another great advantage of single page applications. You know, even if your uh, application hasn't initialized and, and your user starts using the site, it, it doesn't matter. It just does a full page, page refresh and tries again. Uh, so let's go through most of a journey. Uh, I can go to my trolley, hopefully, if the internet will allow it. Perhaps not. No. Demo gods are displeased. It says no. Let's try one last thing and go to a slots page. Doesn't matter, you get the point. It's the same, JavaScript, client side and server side does the same thing. JavaScript on the client side is just a kind of form of progressive enhancement. It just enhance, it enhances the experience for the user and makes the site feel a bit more interactive. And I'll very quickly show you a bit of code for this. Um, I don't know how well this will work on the low resolution. But the point I want to make by showing you a bit of code is that this is just a standard React application. Um, it's a bit updated since we started uh, last year. Um, we're using sort of uh, ES6 and ES7 JavaScript now. Um, but it's just a standard uh, React application. We've got various components like uh, sort of a layout. Uh, we can put logic within our templating so we can say if the user's signed in, show a greeting. If they're not signed in, show the sign in component. Uh, really, really simple stuff like that. Um, this is a bit more of a complex uh, component because it's an entire page, but a slightly less complex component would be something like the greeting. And here you just have a little bit of logic and some HTML uh, to get particular greetings, and we gather translations, uh, and that's about it. I mean, that's most of the code we really need to look at at this point without taking a really deep dive. So that's the application that we built. Um, and we're updating it all the time. Uh, we came through quite a long journey since the early last year um, to get to this point. And the main message I'm going to have from this talk is to just keep changing what you're doing and keep changing your stack. Um, so the journey we made, as I said, um, Flux was, uh, well, it didn't exist when we started, so we were pre-Flux at that time. But luckily, with these small single-page applications, we have most of the data we need to show the page, so we just load it into the page and pass it down as props, and we're all good. And if anything does change, like you know, we apply a filter to a search result, we can just use normal set state in particular components, and we're all good. 
but as our application grew, suddenly the logic in our pages started to get really kind of messy, uh, and we realized we needed Flux. Well, when Flux started to exist, that is. Um, so we built our own Flux implementation, but probably foolishly, because we thought Facebook's was too complicated. Um, so we actually just had Flux stores for our data, but we put all of our logic in there as well. Uh, and that worked great um, for a while, until, once again, our application got too big. And suddenly our Flux stores were too big and too complicated. So we split it out again, and we went for Facebook's uh, full implementation, as we should have done from the beginning. Um, and so now we have UI, we have stores for our data, and we have actions for our logic, which is all fine. Then we started to add immutable data to this application. Um, so you know, developers, when they're uh, working with data in their UI, they can be much, they can much easier reason with like the shape of their data, whether it's changed or not. Uh, and also, it improves performance because components can check whether data has changed much easier. If you have immutable data, it can just check memory references to know whether something changed, and then it knows whether to re-render or not. And we've even started to adopt GraphQL, um, Facebook's relatively new data transfer um, protocol, I guess you call it. Um, but only in a sort of an internal API outside of this application. So we're using it mostly for sort of type checking um, and uh, creating sort of response schemas, but with the idea that eventually we'll be able to adopt GraphQL on the client side and have a GraphQL connection between the client side and this, and this API. And that's really good for mobile performance because, you know, especially if you're in a country where data is very expensive, GraphQL, you can make sure that you're never overfetching and you only need to ever make one call for the data you need. Um, and one thing we haven't done yet is we're looking at sort of more advanced frameworks than Flux or Patterns, something like Relay or Redux or even Curses, um, because we want to kind of encapsulate our components and make them more shareable and more independent of the application. Um, Relay, as an example, can really help us with this. Um, we've used cursors with uh, uh, an immutable global application state on another project before, and that works really well. Um, we're really interested in what Facebook has done with Relay. I mean, as you could see with Flux, every time we kind of moved off what Facebook had done, we realized that we were wrong, and Facebook was right, and we went back to Facebook's way. Um, so uh, Relay could be a really interesting way of, of encapsulating your components to make them sort of more generic, shareable between projects, perhaps. So, this is what we've used. And when we gave this talk back in our React Meetup, we run a React Meetup in London, um, which is really popular, um, somebody described this slide as the most hipster tech stack they'd ever seen. Um, which actually, when you look at it now, this is starting to look a bit more like a normal React um, code stack um, uh, today, which is quite reassuring. It says that we're kind of going on the right track. Ironically, that kind of makes it more hipster because we were using this stuff before it was cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can see there's a lot of changes that we've gone through um, to get to the point we are today. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these, um, just some interesting ones, like the language we were using. We didn't even use JavaScript at the beginning, we used LiveScript. Um, LiveScript is an amazing language that uh, transpiles down to JavaScript, but it makes it much more functional and much more powerful, a bit like CoffeeScript, but without some of the problems CoffeeScript has. And LiveScript is great, we love it, but we realize that there are advantages in kind of going with the flow in these kind of things. There's a massive, vibrant community built around React and JavaScript and JSX, and React itself was kind of making it more difficult with the updates they made to adopt different languages. So we went back to ES6 and JSX with Babel as a uh, transpiler, and onto ES7. I should mention that things on Bold are the things we're using right now. And we love it. Um, ES6 and ES7 are powerful languages. Um, LiveScript's great, but it's, you know, there's actually virtue in going with the mainstream. Um, obviously, we've been keeping up to date with React. Um, some of those upgrades have been easy. Some of them have not been easy whatsoever. Um, we've even started to shift in the kind of server-side uh, frameworks that we're using. We're using Express. We've started on that internal API I mentioned using Koa. Um, if anyone knows Koa, it's a sort of a new version of Express made by the same people. It uses ES7 generators everywhere, and it's completely insane, but it's awesome, so we probably use that everywhere now. Um, 
Flux we mentioned, less we're going away from, and even SAS, we're going for CSS modules, we think that's the future, blah, 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 blah. We've gone from super agent to fetch because we always believe that you know, you've got to use this sort of the native um, experience on the platform you're using. Uh, fetch is pretty widely supported now, but for those browsers that it's not supported on, you can, you can uh, polyfill it, it's fine. Um, as React has updated, we've gone from doing unit testing, com uh, rendering our components within JS DOM as a mock DOM. Now we use Shallow Renderer. Uh, now it's available in React, and our unit tests run much faster. There's a lot of change. Um, so the most important thing why I'm here today, what lessons did we learn along the way? Well, this is an interesting one. I think the most interesting, and possibly the most controversial. There's no need to deliver JavaScript to old engines. Um, and it's, uh, I need to explain that. It's not just that for old phones um, that can't run JavaScript, you don't deliver it. Um, when we were developing this, we started running um, the application on some you know, relatively older devices, like sort of devices running Android 2.3 with quite slow processors. And the experience was terrible. Um, the page was quick to load, quick to download. The JavaScript was quick to download. But just passing that code and initializing that code took forever. It could take a minute before the user could actually interact with the site, because that JavaScript initialization was blocking the experience on the browser as well. I mean, even though the HTML was there, they couldn't press a button. So we thought, well, hang on a minute. Our application is isomorphic. It works without the JavaScript, and that's the thing causing the problem here. Let's just not send it to anybody. Well, not to anybody, to these browsers. Uh, so we, we turned it off. We didn't send it. We inspect the user agent, and we say, if you're an old uh, browser engine, then we don't send the JavaScript. And the experience is 10 times better. It's, it's multitudes better. The website is incredibly fast. Even though the, the user is making a full page refresh every time they press a button, they're only downloading HTML and CSS. And so by removing JavaScript for those users, the, experience, the user experience has been massively improved. And that's one of the sort of interesting things that we've done in this project, is that we just look at your device and say, if you're not worthy of the JavaScript, you don't get it. Uh, and you'll get a better experience for it. Um, and, uh, and it allows us, as developers, to write much more kind of future-facing JavaScript um, for those that do have newer browsers. And there's a lot of other lessons that we've learned. Um, go with the flow, I mentioned. You know, we went a bit crazy with LiveScript. Actually, we think it, we were better sticking with the mainstream with sort of ES6. Um, smaller, more focused components. Uh, this is something that we learned as we upgraded through React. LiveScript allows you to kind of write out the DOM. It kind of looks like Jade as you do it, but you can put expressions right in line and put all your logic. And it was so easy that it started to look like a templating language, and we're just writing everything in one place. When we switched to JSX, it forced us to make kind of smaller components. And so we realized, yeah, that's better. These components are much easier to read. We can much easier understand what they do, um, and they're much easier to test. Um, use context if you need to. Uh, some people still don't know about context in React. Um, if you don't know, it's a sort of third data transfer, transfer way Third way of getting data through your application, you have props, you have states, and you have context. And context is just data that is passed to every component in your tree. Uh, and we use that for sort of config. We use it for references to our Flux stores, uh, all that kind of stuff. We didn't use it at first. We found out about it. It's really, really useful. And it's still not very well documented. Um, don't go crazy with Flux. Um, so we did. Uh, we went pretty crazy with Flux. We tried to be very clever and have components that sort of automatically connect to specific stores. That was great for our application because it meant we could just take a component, put it in a completely different page. We didn't need to wire it up. It just worked. It looked at the trolley and knew everything about the world we were in. Um, but it was terrible for performance because when a store updated, um, all of the components connected to it updated. And some of those components might have been children of others. So a parent component updates it causes all the children to re-render. And then one of those children updates from the store as well and re-renders again. And we had situations where um, from one action, say adding an item to the trolley, some components could be re-rendering maybe 10 times. Uh, just completely wasted processing time, really slowing down the application. 
So we decided to simplify it. We connect to our Flux stores right at the top of the application and just pass that data down, just old-fashioned style. It's just much better. It's much simpler. We shouldn't have tried to be clever. Um, portability is not equal to shareability. Um, I'm probably sort of uh, hijacking words here. Um, what I mean by portability is, what I mean by this in general, is that a component that is transferable within your application is not the same as a component that is general and can be transferred between different projects. Um, this is something that we realized way too late when we started doing all this clever stuff, having components that connected to our own stores for data, um, and we could just drop them in any part of our, our application and they would just work, and then the client comes along and says, oh, that's great. These components, could we just use them in another project? We go, oh. Uh, some of them you can, uh, but others you can't because we cheated. Um, so you've got to think about this um, in the early days so you don't make the same mistakes we do. Do you want components that can just drop into any part of your application, or do you want to be able to share them across a business? Um, and if you do want to share them across a business, you need to pass everything down into them, all of the data, all of the uh, actions, so they don't have any dependencies. Keep your components dumb is essentially the way to go. But the main message of this talk is embrace transition uh, and change. Um, as you saw, there's a lot of things that we changed in this project. And we only manage it by doing things absolutely as incrementally as we can. We never, ever say, we want to change the way we're writing a component. or We want to change the way we connect to stores in our application and do it all across the board. That's impossible to manage. Um, you'll spend forever on it, and you'll introduce bugs along the way. Always, always, always do incremental changes, um, and you'll get to where you want to be. Uh, so where to now with this application? Well, the uh, sort of multiple page structure of components, um, that's a great kind of developer um, enhancement. Um, it allowed us to break up the problem and get to where we are now. Um, it's not it's not really a user benefit, and everything should be a user benefit. Um, we should be a single page isomorphic application, um, so the user could load up at any page and then just carry on client side, and it would feel much more responsive because of that. Uh, as we said with Relay, we want to wrap com components in containers, so you have a dumb component and something more clever that gives it the data it needs. But we also want to do continuous delivery on uh, the project with, with Docker. And these two things are kind of related. It's the same concept, right? Your component is like a tiny application, and it stays dumb, and it doesn't know about the outside world. You put a wrapper around it to make it aware of the outside world with the data it needs or the logic it needs. It's the same thing for your application. You wrap it in Docker. Um, it doesn't need to know about the outside world, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, we're big proponents of continuous delivery. Red Badger, we use it on other projects heavily. Uh, we haven't been able to do it on this project yet, so we're going to move on to that. Uh, we're using more advanced features like ES7, so we're using decorators on our components to do sort of more clever component composition, um, and possibly even share parts of our application with React Native. Um, we really love React Native. We haven't been able to use it with a client yet. Uh, but we've got lots of sort of demo applications and, and things that we've been playing with. And if you keep all of your logic out of your UI, like we should have done from the beginning, that's just raw JavaScript. JavaScript. It runs anywhere, and you can share all of that code. So even if the UI is different between a React app and a React Native app, all of your Flux stores and your actions and stuff, you can just reuse that stuff um, and uh, make these applications much, much quicker. So. That's like a really short tour through Tesco. I'd love to sort of deep dive into stuff, but then you wouldn't see any of the other application and you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Um, so we're just gonna done a big spread. Um, but the big message is, if you plan everything at the beginning and try and, and change everything in one big bang, you set yourself up for failure. If you try and make changes incrementally, doing the smallest changes possible along the way, you can always get to where you want to be. So I'll open it to questions and thanks. Any questions? Yes. How can we be sure that it works everywhere? 
do you mean? Oh, yeah, so we, we have a sort of a full stack of integration tests. So we use sort of Cucumber, uh, and we go through multiple journeys every time we do a build um, to make sure that everything is working. And we do that with JavaScript on and off, um, just to make sure all of the core functionality is working. The actual brief at the beginning of the project was that we only needed non-JavaScript to do a, a core journey. Um, but React just allowed us to do it everywhere. Um, It's probably, when we're developing, there's probably not uh, one rule, I wouldn't say. I think it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I think the trickiest ones to do isomorphically is like a big form or something. Um, I've had situations where you have like products with checkboxes next to them, you select each one, and then you hit like add to trolley. That was a nightmare to do without JavaScript, and piss easy to do <laughs> with JavaScript. So. That I obviously started with the non-JavaScript one because that was the hardest. Other ones, you can just carry on normally and just you know add a um, add a URL into a button or something, and then you're done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, we do a full render of the application, render all of the HTML uh, on the server side, send that over. And then we have a startup script that sort of scrapes through that data, uh, and then just and then just calls React Render essentially with the same page again, but with the with the data picked up, and it just picks up on the client side. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So, for anyone interesting, the, the question was if a browser doesn't support push state, then yeah, we just we just give them the non JS experience and 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 we stop caring. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, thank you, everyone.